Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, so we're speaking to Sarah King from Rewilding Britain, who is the Rewilding Manager there. And this is the first series back for the free webinar series we're going to be hosting on the first Friday of every month. Um, bear with me one second. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you want to introduce yourselves to the chat and let us know where you're from or which organization you work for. And for any questions, if you want to put those into the Q&A and we'll get to that at the end. Just a little bit about Mammal Society. So this is our vision. So it's a future in which sustainable mammal populations thrive as part of a healthy and diverse ecosystems, benefiting people and nature across the British Isles. And our mission. So our mission is threefold. We work to ensure a bright future for mammals by inspiring, informing, and supporting conservation projects and policies. We also empower citizen scientists, students, and nature champions to get involved. And we seek to build public awareness of and support for mammal conservation through our education, communications, and campaigns. So I'm gonna hand over to Sara now, who's going to talk us through Keystone species and their role in rewilding. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen. Excellent. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle stop tour around rewilding and also about keystone species and their role in the rewilding process. Um, I am an ecologist by background and I do have a bit of a soft spot for mammals. So this is quite a mammal heavy presentation, um, but I will try and mention other things and, and their importance as well along the way. Um, before I start, though, I just want to introduce Rewilding Britain to anyone who um, doesn't know what we do and just to give a brief overview and introduction to what we define rewilding to be. Um, so as an organisation, as a charity, we have three main areas of work. We try to catalyse rewilding through supporting landowners and land managers who are rewilding on the ground. And we do that through um, our rewilding network, where we help to facilitate knowledge exchange and work with those landowners to support them through all of the rewilding that they're planning to do and their strategy and to help them to implement it and reduce some of the barriers that they face. We also influence um, policy um, and advocate for rewilding and again, removing barriers to rewilding across Britain. And we engage with a range of audiences to talk about what rewilding is and the importance of it, um, especially here in Britain, where we have quite a lot of nature depleted um, ecosystems and have quite a lot of work to do to try and kickstart that nature recovery. So just so that we're all on the same page, um, it's always useful just to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing when we're talking about rewilding. It's quite an umbrella term with a lot of different definitions. Um, and the definition that we work to is that rewilding is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. Um, this doesn't mean closing the gate and walking away. It means restoring those ecosystems, intervening to then allow natural processes to lead the way a little bit more, usually in a few years time, um, once we've managed to restore some of those ecosystems and those processes. It also encourages a balance between people and nature. And we need to remember that we are part of ecosystems. Um, it's not about excluding people from the landscape, but really reframing our role within a landscape, uh, working with natural processes rather than to particular outcomes. And at Rewilding Britain, we have five principles of rewilding that sits under this definition, which is supporting people and nature together, working at nature's scale. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, letting nature lead. So instead of us dictating how we want a landscape to look and the different habitat types that we've got there, it's about letting nature lead the way, restoring those natural processes and seeing what happens. And actually what this does is it creates a complexity of dynamic landscapes um, that are changing all the time and gives us this really complex mosaics of different habitats rather than blocking habitats into different types within the landscape. Um, our fourth principle is about creating resilient nature-based economies and enterprises. And through some of the rewilding projects that we've got in Britain, we can start to see these enterprises that can be created on rewilding landscapes, whether it's tourism offerings or 
recreation, well-being programs, education programs, um, and sometimes products such as wild meat. And we also need to change our thinking and start to think more long term. A lot of rewilding projects in Britain are setting their vision as a 200 year vision in some cases. So instead of thinking about 5, 10, 15 years, what we start to need to think about is how are these landscapes going to look in 50, 75, 100 years? And what can we do now to allow those um, landscapes to function in 50 years time? So just going back to that idea of scale, um, and this really is just to illustrate why we want to start thinking about larger scale landscapes when we're thinking about rewilding. So um, the green dots on here um, are typical nature reserves. Um, so they generally are small in size and the management intensity is usually quite high. Um, and that's because they have specific habitats or species that they are being protected for. So they're really keeping those protected habitats and priority species there. And, and they've been able to protect quite a lot of important habitats and species over time. But generally, they're quite small scale. And so they're quite intensively managed. When we're looking at rewilding, what we're trying to do is bring um, sites down to the bottom corner of this. So what we want to do is increase the project size as much as we can, thinking of that landscape scale, and through that, reducing management intensity. And so the more space that we have to allow natural processes to, to enact what they want to do within that area, we can start to reduce the amount of intervention that we need to take. So the blue uh, dots on this graph are rewilding projects. So as you can see, they're much lower down the management intensity axis, and they're starting to work along the project size and increase in size as much as possible. And then the kind of turquoisey greeny dots on here are some of the international rewilding projects as well. So you can start to see where we're trying to get projects to be. And we've got bigger projects like Mar Lodge up in Scotland that's quite low down in terms of management intensity and quite far along in terms of their project size. And this is where we can really start to see some of these core cool rewilding areas coming through. I also wanted to just cover why do we need to consider rewilding? Um, what benefits does it bring? Why do we need to even think about this landscape scale change at all? And I think everyone on this call will know that we are feeling the effects of climate warming. Um, we are facing the climate emergency as well as the biodiversity emergency. And as the climate starts to warm, we've done some research to show that the climate is moving northwards at a rate of five kilometers per year. So that potentially requires species um, and plant species to move five kilometers north per year to be able to keep within the range potentially of where they can exist and survive, which is quite significant. Um, there are some mobile species that maybe can do it, but if we're looking at trees and plants and invertebrates, it's going to be a struggle for them to be able to move northwards at five kilometers per year. Um, and also they may not necessarily have the wildlife corridors to allow them to do it. So what we need to start thinking about is creating the space for nature to be able to move as the climate changes and also to create as much complexity and as many different opportunities for wildlife as possible. Um, so this is where rewilding comes in as a shift in mindset and a different approach to try and think about some of this large scale, large scale change that we need. So just in terms of what that looks like, if we imagine a landscape, we might have some core areas in there, which is the darker areas on this diagram. And these are maybe some of the really large scale rewilding projects where nature is allowed to lead the way. And we've got these dynamic mosaics of different habitat. We then might have smaller rewilding areas, um, which we've labeled on here as stepping stone habitats. And these could be designated sites or they could be smaller scale rewilding projects that allow wildlife to move within that corridor and to give them refuges within that. And then we need to think about landscape corridors and how do we connect up these cores and these stepping stones to allow nature to move within a landscape. And within that, we might have farmland, um, places that are producing food. We might have places where people live, um, but we just got to think about that connectivity and how it all joins up. And I mentioned at the start of the presentation that we need to remember that we are part of nature. And this is a lovely diagram from Ark Nature in the Netherlands. And what it shows um, is that in the past, we used to be very connected with nature. We used to work and live alongside quite a lot of the animals that we're missing from Britain now. 
But as we started to change our approaches to land management and we started to categorize different land management approaches, we start to see those threads come away and we started to separate ourselves from nature and see ourselves as being away from it. Um, and the vision of this diagram is to try and bring these threads back together again and see ourselves as being part of these ecosystems, working within them, living within them again, and being a part of those natural processes. And I quite like this diagram as well, because it does start to show that complexity of ecosystems and nature, and also how connected we all are to different things. And I think it's really true that if you pull at one element of nature, what you tend to find is that everything then comes with it. So it's really difficult to isolate one part of it without really seeing how interconnected it is to the wider ecosystem. And what rewilding tries to do is bring that complexity together um, and start to study those relationships and really start to improve our knowledge about how nature is interconnected and how some of these natural processes can help with nature recovery. So I just want to talk about natural processes because again it's useful for us all to know what we're talking about when we're using some of these terms and I know some of these terms might not necessarily be familiar to everyone. So when I'm talking about natural processes, I'm talking about all the interactions that support life. So this could be the change of the seasons um, and it's the 1st of March today, so the start of spring. So we're starting to see some of that change come through already. We're talking about life and death and the role of carcasses um, and, and how they can help with our nutrient cycles and our natural processes. They include weather, geological processes, so erosion, deposition, we're thinking about the water cycle and hydrology, so rivers forming, wetlands, how that water then ends up going out to the sea, soils and soil formation, the impact of animals, so grazing, which I'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation, and then habitat succession, which is where nature is always trying to have this succession happening. So grassland wants to be scrubbed that wants to be woodland and then the role of animals to push back that succession um, and disturb it and start to create these dynamic habitats that we start to see. And I quite like to use a game of Jenga um, as an image for when we think about our natural processes. So if we imagine our Jenga tower, um, it, if we had all the pieces in place, it would be a solid tower. It's quite solid. It's not likely to fall over. If we start taking some of our natural processes away, so we don't have any of our large predators in Britain anymore, so that's a couple of pieces that have taken out. We might have straightened our rivers, so we'll take a few more pieces out. And what happens is the tower is still standing, but it's very wobbly. So when you start to bring in climate emergency, extreme weather, um, other pressures on our land, you've got a very wobbly tower that could quite easily fall. So when we're looking at intervening and restoring natural processes, we're trying to think about how we can put those blocks back in place to the Jenga tower to make it more resilient and more solid. And if we can't bring a natural process back, so for example, we don't have wolves in Britain at the moment, then we might mimic that through harvesting animals or creating um, a, that kind of ecology of fear within a landscape to move animals through. And that can then restore the Jenga tower to make it a little bit more solid. So natural processes need space. I've already spoken about why we want to start thinking at the landscape scale. And as I said, sometimes we might need to mimic those natural processes through our actions. So things like coppicing is mimicking the role of bison and beavers. We might put leaky dams into some of our watercourses, again, to mimic the role of beavers and to create those wetlands and to slow the flow. We harvest animals on a lot of rewilding projects um, to mimic the predators that are missing, and that can then also produce wild meat. And even things like sustainable forestry, so continuous canopy forestry, when it's where instead of clear felling woodland, we take trees out um, throughout the woodland, is mimicking the role of herbivores like bison that might push those trees over. So it's thinking a little bit differently about what natural processes should be there and how might we mimic them either through reintroductions or through human intervention and management. And I often get questioned with, have we actually got the space? We're an island. We've got high population here. We don't have the space for rewilding. Um, we certainly don't have the space for some of these landscape scale changes. And we're doing a study at the moment to look at where could we deliver 30% rewilding um, by 2030. And this is in line with government targets for 30% in nature recovery. And what we've started to see is that actually there is definitely space for rewilding. 
if we look at the low grade agricultural land, so the least productive land for food and use that instead for nature recovery, we actually lose only a small amount of food production. But the benefits that we can get from creating these nature recovery areas in terms of carbon, water quality, air quality, well-being, as well as biodiversity um, are huge. And if anyone is interested in this, I won't talk about it too much today, but the National Food Strategy for England has come out that's shown where we could take 20% of the least productive land out of agriculture and put that instead to nature recovery and to allow areas and spaces like this. And we only lose 3% of the total calories. So there's definitely space in the UK for rewilding. And I think there's definitely space for it sitting alongside other land uses like food and forestry. But I'm not going to talk too much about that today. I'm going to talk about keystone species. And as I said, I'm a bit biased towards um, mammals. So um, hopefully that's OK for everyone here. But a lot of this does also apply to other keystone species as well. As I mentioned, we do have degraded landscapes in Britain. Uh, we have got species that are missing from here. And a lot of them are keystone species. So when we're talking about keystone species, they're animals and species that have a disproportionate impact on our ecosystems. So when they're missing, it can mean the ecosystems get out of balance. When we bring them back, the benefits that they have on their ecosystems are much higher than some of the other species that might come back or, or be present there. So we know that top predators, including whales, um, if we're talking about marine, can drive eco ecological processes from the top of the food chain to the bottom. And this is known as a trophic cascade. Some people might be familiar with Yellowstone and the roles, the role that wolves had there when they were reintroduced. This is where the trophic cascade came in. So wolves were introduced to Yellowstone, reduced the number of deer, which increased the amount of vegetation that was allowed to recover because the deer weren't browsing on them. And that has then created a more diverse habitat within the landscape that supports a whole range of other species as well. But keystone species are not all predators and trophic cascades don't always flow from top to bottom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the different keystone species um, in Britain um, and the roles that they might have. Just in terms of what we're missing. So I've just taken this from the Rewilding Britain website uh, where we've got a page on what we call rewilding superstars. And that goes through um, some of the species that may have once been native here that we might be missing. And we take inspiration from mainland Europe and the animals that they have there. Um, and I would just caveat this, that rewilding isn't about trying to turn back the clock to the past, but using the past for inspiration of what might be missing and what might be missing from our Jenga tower. So just in terms of this list, I've put red crosses through the things that we don't have here yet. Um, so I'll just go through this, this briefly, just to introduce you to it a little bit. So we've got the aurochs, which is an extinct a wild cattle. We don't have those anymore, they're extinct. So rewilding projects will introduce native breeds of livestock to mimic their loss. Eurasian beavers are starting to come back and I'll talk a little bit about more, more about them later on. European bison, we've seen being reintroduced into Kent. Fallow deer, red deer and roe deer are generally still in the wild across most of Britain, although red deer are extinct from um, some areas and missing from some areas, especially in England. Wild boar, um, there are some populations in the Forest of Dean and in Scotland. Um, these are termed feral pigs and rewilding projects will use pigs as a proxy. Wild horses, again, is an extinct species like the aurochs. So we're bringing in native ponies to mimic those. And wild cats are still present in Scotland. And I will tell you a little bit more about some of the plans for wild cats for the rest of Britain. But we don't have any elk, we don't have any lynx, and we don't have any wolves. Um, they are definitely not present here. Um, so that's missing natural processes that we might need to consider. So I'm just going to talk about um, some of these different groups. I'm not going to talk about individual species, just because we probably would be here all afternoon. Um, but I thought if I grouped them into some of the areas, I could tell you a little bit about um, how these are affecting natural processes and why we need to consider them. So in terms of predators, we do have a few of these um, still within our countryside. Um, we also have some that are being reintroduced. So fox, very widespread across um, the whole of Britain. Sometimes maybe the balance is slightly wrong in terms of their levels. And this is possibly because 
we have a lot of meso predators like fox, but we don't have any of the large predators here. Um, so if we were to think about bringing back lynx, um, bringing back wolves, then they naturally repress the number of meso predators, so the number of foxes. Um, so again, this is where some keystone species aren't present, so maybe we have things out of balance. Uh, many of you will recognize the pine martin. Um, these are being actively reintroduced to a lot of areas, and they're present already in a lot of areas in Britain. And what we can start to see is when pine martins come back in, they start to predate on grey squirrels, um, which can then create uh, an area for red squirrels to be reintroduced. So again, we start to see that pine martins could be returned to restore some of that natural balance. Wildcats also um, are another one on here. They have historically been restricted mostly to Scotland and aren't doing that well in Scotland. So there's a reinforcement program happening to try and restore this species back, as well as looking at whether we can reintroduce it to other areas of England and Wales. And the role of it really is to try to, again, restore some balance around those prey um, species. So small mammals, voles, my mice in particular, it will predate on those and reduce some of those populations and create a bit more of a balance. Um, lynx are one that, if we brought back to Britain, would do well at, at controlling rodent numbers and predating on those. Um, and I think most people probably know about wolves um, and the role that they could potentially have. And I've already mentioned the Yellowstone example. Why do we need to worry about predators? They cause lots of conflict. Should we just ignore them? Um, will they create lots of opportunities um, to try and change the behavior of herbivores? So there's something called the landscape of fear, that when predators are present, um, herbivores like deer in particular will be always on the lookout for these predators and will be much more alert. And that means that they browse and eat less, which means they move on to other areas and that creates natural regeneration. So yes, we absolutely need to think about these predators and the role that they have um, and whether we can start to consider bringing at least some of them back to restore some of that balance. I'm now going to move on to omnivores um, and some of the omnivores that we have present and also are missing. Um, so badgers are quite common, um, probably something that people come across quite often are, are badgers in our countryside. Um, they also have a role in our ecosystems. They create lots of burrows. They do a lot of digging, um, which is a kind of mini version of what the wild boar can bring to an area. Um, wild boar and pigs are used quite often on rewilding projects because they do what we call rootling. So essentially it's a little bit like gardening um, or ploughing. They start to disturb the ground, um, which starts to create areas to then allow seeds to settle and almost are the resetters of the landscape. So it just kind of gives that opportunity for successional or new plants to come in. Um, and just creates a mosaic of different opportunities. And I'll show you a few photos of some of the pigs at NEP on the next slide. And then of course, there's brown bear, uh, which uh, we don't have in Britain anymore and um, possibly don't have the space for them. But again, they're another missing keystone species that can also have um, an impact on our landscapes. Here's just a couple of photos I've got of the Tamworth pigs at NEP. So they introduced Tamworth pigs as a proxy for the wild boar. They're not allowed to bring wild boar onto net because they're part of the Dangerous Wild Animals Act. So instead they have these gingery Tamworth pigs that are roaming across the NEP estate. And what you can start to see here is this is their rootling behavior. So they've been turning over the soil, creating this bare ground. And what this starts to do is create opportunities for other seeds to get in, get a hold um, and create a diversity within the grassland. And NEP are also studying to see the impact that these rootling areas have on things like turtle doves, um, purple emperor butterflies, and a lot of other things that they've got there. Um, so really, really important natural process that we are missing from quite a lot of our landscape and cre can create a real diversity, especially within grassland. Um, word of warning though, pigs do root on quite a large area. So again, we need that scale to be able to have pigs in the landscape before otherwise they might just end up rootling quite quite a lot of the rewilding site. And then I'm going to talk about herbivores, which um, we do tend to focus on most at Rewilding Britain because they can have such a big impact on a landscape. Um, when we look at rewilding, especially in Britain, what we're thinking about is trying to get a mix of different herbivores in the landscape in low densities to create this mosaic. And as, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, 
what herbivores do is they push against that natural succession of vegetation. So grassland wants to become scrub, that wants to become woodland. When you put the herbivores in, they start to disrupt that linear process and create, um, I guess, a messiness and a, a complete mosaic of different habitats. So rewilding projects will use cattle, like longhorn cattle, highland cows, um, galloways, all sorts of different cattle um, in low densities to replace the missing auroch. Um, we also have a very important role for deer on rewilding projects, so roe and red deer, they browse habitats, they will um, create that mosaic as well, especially within woodland. If they're in high numbers, which we see quite a lot around the Britain, we might need to reduce their numbers through culling um, to try and restore some of that balance. So often rewilding projects might be looking more at deer management um, to try and reduce them down to more natural levels to still keep them in the landscape because they're important, but to make sure that there's still some natural regeneration of vegetation within those areas as well. Front and centre on this slide, we've got bison. Um, they are a lot bigger than cattle and can push over trees. They can debark trees. They can do, um, they can um, kill trees essentially, um, which creates standing deadwood, which is really important for things like woodpecker and invertebrates. And it's called ring barking, where they basically strip a ring around the bottom of the tree. Looks like they're damaging and um, destroying a woodland, but actually this, as I said, this standing deadwood is really important um, for a lot of different species and what they'll also do is create um, dust baths in the landscape again creating this bare ground patches that's really important for allowing seeds to get in as well as supporting other invertebrates um, and then moose or elk um, we don't have any in britain they did used to be here again provide quite a good opportunity to have a large herbivore especially within wetland habitats where they do a similar thing and they, they can just create those mosaics and that disturbance so thinking about our herbivore guilds and what might be missing here is a really important part of a rewilding project and allowing them to have as much freedom within the landscape as possible to move around, to choose where they graze, to graze in different areas um, is a really important natural process that we are missing often from a lot of our landscapes. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about scavengers. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the Netherlands last year to go to a carcass symposium. Um, and this is a lovely picture that we've got on here of us all looking around a carcass. Um, it smelt as bad as it looks, I can confirm. <laughs> but it was a really important part. Carcasses are a really important part of our natural processes because they create food for scavengers like white-tailed eagles, golden eagles, ravens, um, a whole range of other things. Wild boar will also eat a carcass. And as they degrade and decompose, they reconnect that nutrient cycle. So the nutrients go back into the soil. The bones and the skeletons are also um, licked by herbivores. So horses and cattle will go to skeletons. And they will get the min minerals from them. Um, and they're just a really important part that we're missing from our landscapes um, to really close off that nutrient cycle and get those nutrients back into the um, into the ground. And the symposium that I went to was called the Circle of Life Symposium. So anyone who's seen The Lion King um, will have the song going around in their head now and will start to um, understand why we need to start to think about scavengers and carcasses a little bit more in our landscapes. Um, I'm also going to talk about beavers. I've put them in their own category because for me, beavers were the species that got me into rewilding in the first place. Um, I was lucky enough to go to one of the beaver enclosures in Devon and see the impact that beavers have had in the area. And if you ever want to really understand why we need rewilding and the complexity that I've been talking about throughout this presentation, try and go and see a beaver wetland um, because really it is the complexity that they create is incredible. Um, so beavers will create dams to hold back water because they want to be in the water as much as possible to avoid predation and because it's much easier for them to move around. And the dam structures that they create can be 30 metres wide, they can be really high. Um, you can see how tall this dam was on this picture, really substantial structures. And what they do is that they not only create these wetlands that are incredible for biodiversity and for nature, but they also slow the flow. 
So they can help us with flood mitigation. When we've had some really dry summers, they create these beautiful wetlands um, that hold the water when everything else is in drought. And um, they just are unbelievable ecosystem engineers. Um, so beavers are already in quite a lot of areas in England and in Britain, um, but we absolutely need them because the complexity that they create and the opportunities for different wildlife is absolutely incredible. So I just thought it'd be useful just to provide a little bit of a map of some of the things that are happening, um, because as a movement, rewilding and keystone species reintroduction has been growing so much um, over the last few years. And we're seeing the, the important role of these species and the number of rewilding projects um, grow and grow. So we've got white-tailed eagles are up on um, Mull. That was the first introduction quite a few years ago now. We've also got white-tailed eagles in the Isle of Wight. There are plans being considered at the moment for maybe there might be another reintroduction around the Seven Estuary, which is exciting. And we're starting to see these populations spread out as well. And sightings of white-tailed eagles are happening all across the south of England. I've mentioned the bison in Kent. Um, they've just had another um, bison calf. So they've got a herd of five there now, which is hugely exciting. Um, Lynx, there's a Lynx to Scotland project that's happening at the moment that's at the feasibility and consultation stage. Um, if you want to find out any more of that, there's a website dedicated to it. Hugely exciting to start to look at whether there is that feasibility for Lynx in Scotland. Wildcats, there's projects everywhere at the moment. Um, there's lots of work happening in Scotland to reinforce the population. There's um, projects that are looking at feasibility in Wales, but also Devon and Cornwall, and probably a few others now as well, um, which again is hugely exciting to start to think about how we can bring this species back. And then I've put pelicans on here because I live in Bath um, and I would love to see pelicans back on the Somerset levels. So um, there are feasibility studies looking at it at the moment. I think it's quite a long way off, but I quite enjoy um, keeping it in there just so that we can start thinking about what can we start to bring back, what used to be here, um, and let's start to kind of think big and, and be bold in some of these um, feasibility studies that are happening. Pine Martin I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. This is just a map um, that I've taken from NBN to show the record of Pine Martins um, across Britain. So they are turning up all over the place. It's fantastic to see them coming back. Some of these are a re result of reintroductions. Some of them are where Pine Martins are appearing, where they're dispersing. Um, and I think the impact that this can have on our landscapes, especially in terms of reducing some of the gray squirrel populations, can help with potential damage to trees and to woodlands, but also could open up opportunities um, to bring back red squirrels to some of these areas as well. So they really are starting to, to spread a lot over Britain and I'm sure they're set to spread even more. And I also took a map off the Beaver Trust website, um, which there's possibly a few more on there now. Um, but again, to give you an idea of where beavers are um, within Britain, there's a few wild beaver populations um, in particular, obviously in Scotland, but also in the south of England and a few other places as well. And there's a whole range of enclosed beaver populations that are cropping up. For those who don't know, beavers are a native species, um, but at the moment for England and for Wales, um, wild releases aren't possible. So enclosures are still happening to get these animals back into our landscape. Um, but we hope to see that change soon and to see wild releases allowed um, in England so that we can start to really expand beaver populations um, in areas where it's suitable for them to be. Um, I'm a terrestrial ecologist, so um, I don't know too much about marine, but I didn't want to exclude marine from this presentation because we really shouldn't forget about our seas and the potential for our marine areas to also be rewilded and to have some keystone species there. Um, so I, I haven't got too many slides on marine because, as I said, uh, it's not my specialism at all. Um, and I don't want to be saying the wrong thing, but there is a growing movement around marine um, and we do need to think about keystone species and keystone habitats within there. So a lot of the restoration projects that are happening in Britain are looking at restoring seagrass meadows, kelp, um, but also oysters. And the role that our native oysters have, again, they are a keystone species, is that they filter the water. And they also create these oyster reefs that can help with coastal erosion, but can also support act as nurseries for um, fish um, that can help with our fish stocks. And there are also rewilding projects that have been putting in no take zones, no dredging and trawling areas, which essentially stops the damaging practices from happening there. And we've really started to see nature recover. 
Um, so as we start to see more whales coming into our shores and all sorts of other things, what that starts to indicate is that natural processes are starting to be restored. Um, and I think what we're we're just learning the complexities of the different relationships there as well. Where we've got oysters and seagrass, oysters will filter and clean the water, which will then reduce the amount of sediments and pollutants there, giving light to the seabed that then allows seagrass to come through. So again, that's just one example of some of these complex relationships that we've got happening um, and the potential for seascape scale restoration and rewilding is um, pretty exciting Britain at the moment. So I didn't want to get through a presentation and not mentioned our marine environments. I've spoken quite a lot about the ecology of species reintroductions and keystone species, um, but there's also a lot of other benefits to bringing back some of these species as well. The white-tailed eagle reintroduction in Mull in Scotland um, is supporting a whole load of nature-based economies and jobs. They've estimated, I think this might be outdated now, I think it might have been updated, but five million pounds per year income for mull from tourism from the white-tailed eagles, 1.4 million local income and 110 jobs per year. We're seeing a whole load of support and interest in, in species reintroductions from people who want to go and visit these areas to webcams to general support just increasing. And I think they're a real opportunity to restore some of that cultural connection, but also to restore our connection with nature. Um, and how we interact with it and how we can go and enjoy it and give us a bit of inspiration and hope amongst quite a lot of um, depressing news stories around nature's decline. So I think they're a really important element to what we do um, and anything that gives us hope has to be something that we need to support really. I'm just going to finish the presentation with talking a little bit about what rewilding looks like, because um, I just thought it would be important just to show, you know, what are we talking about when we're talking about some of these rewilding landscapes. So I'm going to start with some illustrations from Rewilding Europe um, to give you an idea of some of the landscapes that they're working on um, on mainland Europe. So I'm going to start with the Danube Delta. Um, and within this, you can see they've reintroduced pelicans to the area, they've restored the hydrology in the wetlands, they've got water buffalo there, as well as a few other things. It's supporting a whole range of tourism opportunities, as well as carbon sequestration, um, biodiversity and nature recovery, clean air and water, all sorts of benefits and ecosystem services as well. But I'd like to think that maybe we can take inspiration from the Danube Delta, maybe think about the Somerset levels and, and maybe we could replicate something similar here if we were thinking about the Somerset levels. Um, so it's quite a good example of maybe what we could possibly have in some of our areas in Britain. Here's an illustration from the Southern Carpathian, so a slightly different landscape. This is more of a, a mountainous upland landscape um, where they've reintroduced bison. They've got wolves there now. Um, they've also started looking at carcasses and, and vultures and the circle of life. Um, there's much more diversity within this illustration. We've got scrub, we've got trees, as well as, again, people living within these landscapes and being a part of it as well. And then the Great Coa Valley um, is another great example where lynx have been reintroduced um, to the area and doing really well. There are wild horses and ponies within this landscape. Um, and as well as the reintroduced herbivores and the mosaic of different habitats that we see here, again, people are being supported and rural communities that were facing land abandonment are now facing jobs and opportunities for communities to thrive. Um, and for people to live within these areas as well. Um, Rewilding Europe have 10 landscapes now, and they've done an illustration for each one. So if anyone wants to have a look at some more of those landscapes, I've only picked out three here um, just to give a flavour of them, but they are also available on the Rewilding Europe website. So worth having a look if you want some more inspiration. But how can we apply this to Britain? We operate within Britain, so we want to make sure that the, we take inspiration from Europe, but we start to see what does this look like in a British context. Um, this is just a photo of some wood pasture that's quite a common landscape that we see in rewilding projects where you've got patches of scrub, you've got patches of open grassland, you've got patches of woodland, and all of it starts to mix up. So it's very difficult to draw a line around a habitat and say, this is the woodland, this is a grass and this is a scrub. We start to see it all mixing and blurring into one and blurring those lines. And the complexity that this creates provides so many opportunities for a whole range of wildlife. Uh, we've done an illustration, um, which is shown here, which um, is our 
imagine using our imagination to think about what an upland landscape could look like in Britain. Obviously, it's over exaggerated with some of the species that we see here. But the idea is that it gives you a flavour for what our upland uh, rewilding landscapes could look like within a valley. So in this area, we've got a big beaver dam that's holding back the flow. We've got a river that's been restored and allowed to rewiggle and move within it, the area as it wants to, um, creating this dynamic wetland within it. Um, we've got some of the keystone species back in. So we've got a cheeky lynx that's just hanging out on the tree there. Um, we've got lots of herbivores in the background and just a mosaic of scrub and trees and all these other habitats that will just provide a variety of opportunities for a whole range of different species. And we've got some real examples as well of rewilding across Britain. Um, I like to call them a kaleidoscope of different approaches. Each rewilding project is new, is completely unique and different. Um, there's no one size fits all when it comes to rewilding. It depends on the habitats you've got there, the landscapes you're working in, um, and the different communities around you as well. So we've got wood pasture habitats like at NEP. There's heathland habitats like at Purbeck. We've got um, coastal regions of salt marshes that are rewilding. Um, some of the marine projects that I've spoken about as well. In some areas, we need tree planting to restore some of the seed source. In other areas, it's about bringing some of these herbivores back to create that dynamic mosaic. And what we start to see across rewilding projects is not only are they all unique, but also they change all the time. So if you go back year on year, you'll see a slightly different landscape every time you go there, depending on where the herbivores have been and what they've been doing. And I find this incredibly exciting. We're learning so much from all of these rewilding projects about nature, about species, um, and it's brilliant to see the whole range of different approaches that are happening. And I'm lucky enough to work with the Rewilding Network, which we've set up to try and help facilitate knowledge exchange between rewilding projects. Um, because they're all doing new and different things, we're trying to build up that knowledge base of what works, what doesn't work, and who's doing different approaches across Britain. And this is growing year on year. Um, we've got a map on our website if you want to explore any of the rewilding projects near you. Um, but we are really getting rewilding projects across the whole of Britain now, um, which is hugely exciting to see. We're also gathering evidence through the rewilding network. Um, so again, starting to look at how can rewilding benefit us? Um, so we've seen through rewilding projects that a 54 increase in job numbers, um, not only more jobs created within these landscapes within 10 years, but also a diversity of different job types from land management through to ecology, um, through to recreation, tourism, wellness, education, a whole range of different opportunities for people to work and live within these landscapes. We've seen a 13 fold increase in volunteer opportunities. Um, we're seeing communities getting involved with rewilding projects, either through volunteering or through co-design. Um, we've got a whole range of different herbivores and, and species that are being reintroduced to these areas as well. And I think the last count, we had about 56 animals and plants that were being considered or were being implemented across these rewilding projects. Um, so we're slowly building up the evidence to show the benefits that they can have on people as well as on biodiversity. So I'm just going to finish with a slide, um, again, just thinking about the future of our landscapes. What do we want from our landscapes? What do we want to see? What do we want to do to support nature recovery? And I hopefully I've um, managed to give you a bit of a flavour of the role that keystone species can have, not just on nature recovery, on biodiversity, on our, ourselves and our environment that we live in, but also to create a little bit more wonder and excitement for people to really reconnect with nature and be able to go out and truly enjoy some of these landscapes. Um, if anyone wants to find out more, this is just a snapshot around rewilding. We've got a whole host of resources on our website, including more detail about some of the key species. So please do take a look on there. You'll also see the rewilding network map if you want to explore any sites. Um, but that's all from me. Just with a final ask to think a bit bigger, think landscape scale, and maybe act a bit wilder as well. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was very interesting. And I have some questions of my own, but I'm sure there'll be lots of other questions from others. So I'll have a look in the box here. So first question. Since we know so little about ecosystem complexity, how can we go about mitigating the risks that are associated with reintroductions when we don't know everything about all those different interactions? 
Yeah, it's a good point. I think um, we can take a lot of um, inspiration and learnings from other people. So rewilding is still quite new in Britain, but they're probably maybe at 20 to 30 years ahead of us in some places in mainland Europe. So we have a great relationship with rewilding Europe and learning from those. And I think there will still be some things that we don't we don't know about. Um, but I think we can learn quite a lot from the projects on mainland Europe and from the teams that are working there and have a little bit more confidence about what could happen. Also, the species that we're talking about, they are species that were once native. So our plants and animals have evolved around these species that are missing. So I think we also, I've learned to have a little bit of confidence in nature. Um, and, and I think we do need to innovate and try new things because that's the only way that we can get nature recovery. So yes, we do need to obviously consider the risk, but I think there's a lot of confidence in some of the species because it has been happening on mainland Europe and we can learn from them, hear about their mistakes as well as their successes and apply them here. So we're not just going in brand new and without any information. Mm, interesting. Um, next one, how can we shift public opinion towards rewilding and, and tying on the, on the end of that, how do we incentivize landowners to rewild? Yeah, so just on the landowners, because that's someone that that's a group that I work with quite a lot. Um, there are incentives coming through. So in England, in particular, there's the new environmental land management scheme that's coming through that's supporting landscape recovery projects. And a lot of those are rewilding. Um, there are other credit schemes and things like that coming through. It's not a model that's completely sorted yet, but it's certainly something that we're seeing happening. Um, and we are doing a lot of work to try and advocate for landowners to be supported for that. In terms of wider audiences, um, I think the more rewilding projects we have in Britain, a lot of them are open access or they're, they offer opportunities for people to stay and visit. They do tours and talks. I think being able to experience a rewilding project, if you can, is the best way to really engage with it. Um, it's difficult to describe the wonders of rewilding. If you can go and visit there, then absolutely please do because experiencing it is the number one thing. But I think what we found and what I've experienced, especially over the last few years, is that we are starting to see through these case study sites and exemplar sites that are coming through, we can start to then show the benefits that they can have. And as that happens, we get this snowball effect of um, people realizing the potential benefits of rewilding and so um, the um, acceptance and engagement from wider audiences is growing and growing and growing which is hugely exciting to see. Mm. So would would you say that kind of links into managing the tensions between humans, livestock and somebody's put here wild stock? Yeah I think um, with land in general there will always be tensions um, I'm not saying that we should rewild everywhere. Absolutely not. We still need to produce food. And as some of these keystone species come in, we will still get conflicts and tensions. Even with um, species like beavers, we've seen them come into some areas where they have come into conflict with farming and agriculture. Um, and so what we've had to do is step in and mitigate and manage that and I think that we will always have to accept that there will need to be some kind of conflict mitigation in the future as these species come in um, because wildlife doesn't always do what we expect it to do so we will always have to step in and manage some of that but I think on the whole that will be only a small number of cases and the benefits of having these species back in far outweigh the potential conflicts and the mitigation and management that we need to do there so um yeah, I think I think we need to consider management, but I think we also need to think about the benefits that these species can bring and think yes and rather than no, we shouldn't have them um, because mm. there could possibly be that conflict. Absolutely. Are there any other approaches that we could consider to reducing numbers of certain species instead of harvesting or culling? I think we could. We could bring back some of our predators and that would help bring back some of the balance. Um, we're quite far off that um, to bring back all of our predator gills. So lynx is being looked at and um, seriously being considered, which is exciting. I think society is definitely quite a far way away from wolves. Ecologically, we might be ready, but culturally, we're definitely not. Um, so until that situation changes, if we didn't 
harvest and cull these animals, we would probably have very out of balanced ecosystems. And you can see that with the red deer numbers in Scotland that are so high that we're not getting natural regeneration within those areas because as soon as new trees start to come through, they will browse them to the ground. Um, and so we do need to accept that with some of those pieces that are missing from our ecosystems, we might need to step in and mimic that because otherwise ecosystems get out of balance and then they're not functioning properly. Um, mm -hmm. So it's an unfortunate um, reality of rewilding in Britain at the moment. Do you think that we actually have room for wolves in the UK? Um, I know there has been some studies um, that have been done that have shown ecologically there is space, um, particularly in Scotland, for wolves. That being said, that's only looking at it ecologically and we can't ignore societal views, communities that are going to be affected by it, landowners that are going to be affected by it as well. So with any species reintroductions, you don't only look at the ecological feasibility for it, you also have to look at community engagement and whether people can accept them to be here. So for wolves, ecologically, yes, there is space. But until we have a proper consultation, engagement, education program with communities who might have to live side by side with them, as well as a proper program of how we manage conflict, how we make sure that these animals can be in the landscape with us, um, we're definitely not at a stage where we have the space for them here. Hmm. When it comes to keystone species, you know, you kind of talked about how it's not always a top down approach and it, it's not a linear system of how it works. Are there any smaller species that you would consider a keystone species that we haven't talked about? I think there's probably quite a few. Um, and I think the other thing with keystone species is that I said in the presentation that we probably don't know everything about nature yet. So I'd probably say that maybe we don't know all the keystone species yet. Um, I'm sure there are some smaller species that play a really important role um, within an ecosystem. And I'd probably argue that, okay, we're focusing on keystone species because they have such a big impact on their ecosystem. But I wouldn't want that to be at the, that, that, we, that we should dismiss all the other species because every species has a role to play within that ecosystem. And as soon as we lose a species from it, we don't really know what complex relationship we're losing from there. Um, so I think when we think about systems and ecosystems, we shouldn't just be thinking about the keystone ones. We should be thinking about everything um, and how can we provide as much space for everything as possible. Absolutely. I read a really interesting article recently about how an invasive ant species affected how lions hunt, which I'm sure some people may have seen. And it's just, you know, it can be the smallest thing that makes such a big difference. Um, yeah, ants, rather... ants are a great example of that. And they we're still only just learning about the role that they have. And then you've got mycorrhizal fungi, which again, we could talk all afternoon about and the role that that has within woodlands and within soils. Um, soils are a whole different thing as well that has its own ecosystem. So there's so much that we still have to learn about these relationships and they're all vitally important. Yeah. One more question. Um, how important is it to consider hybridization for species? Oh, let's just pop down. That are considered... One second, sorry, had a couple come in when I was reading it. Was that hybridization and wild cats? It was about wild cats, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so hybridization is a big problem for wild cats in Scotland. Um, and it's been, it's one of those things that's still an ongoing problem because there's a lot of hybrids um, where wild cats and domestic cats breed. Um, it can be a problem and it's definitely a consideration for all the wild cat projects that are happening. Um, learnings from Europe have shown quite low numbers of hybridization between wild cats and domestic cats, even when they live near each other. Because um, if you've got a healthy wild cat population, wild cats are very territorial. And so they will push out domestic cats. Um, and so you don't have that same pro possibility of hybridization. So I think at the moment, the research is generally showing that the reason we've had hybridization in Scotland to the levels that it is, is because the wildcat population there was really struggling. It was so small and fragmented. They couldn't find enough wildcats to breed with. So that's why they ended up breeding with domestic cats. Um, mm. So it is definitely a consideration and a problem. But again, if we start to look at mainland Europe and the examples there, 
maybe if we get a good solid population of wildcats and we have enough there and they're in the right place, you might actually take away that risk of hybridization. But it's definitely something that these projects are going to have to consider and they are considering them. And there's mitigation like um, neutering programs within the areas as well to try and reduce the risk of that. So I think as with a lot of rewilding, it's let's try something, monitor it, and see what happens and then react to it if things start to change. Mm. Very interesting. Well, thank you very much um, for coming on and speaking to us. I'm sure everybody's thrilled with all the information you've shared. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things we've got coming up with Mammal Society. So if you are out and about, we have a, an excellent app called Mammal Mapper where you can record any, any sites, any tracks and signs, any species that you see while you're out. If you wanted to use that, that would be amazing. We've got our annual conference coming up this April, which will be in Cambridge. We've got some excellent speakers talking on that and you can, you can stay overnight in the accommodation where we're hosting it as well. And finally, if you would like to donate um, or become a member, we, we We'll provide access to our Mammal News magazines and we provide discounts on our trainings and our events. Um, and we, we like all our members to have a sort of voice in, in the work that we do. So if you'd like to get involved, there's a, there's a link there as well. And I think that's everything. Fabulous. Well, thank you everyone for showing up today. And our next webinar will be on the first Friday of April. So if you'd like to come along then, we will see you there.